Hi, everyone. Welcome to Deep Roots Conversations about Theology and Ministry. My name is Eric Ortland, and I teach Hebrew and Old Testament at Oak Hill College. And I'm joined by my dear friend and colleague, Chris Howells, this morning. Chris, you're new to the podcast. Could you tell everyone what were you what you were doing before Oak Hill, what brought you here, and what you're doing here at Oak Hill now? Yeah, thank you, Eric. New to the podcast and newish to the college. So we started at Oak Hill in January earlier this year. Um, having been a student here uh, many years ago, 2007, for a few years then. Between then and now, we, my wife and I, with our three kids, have been living and working in Uganda in a place called Namagongo on the outskirts of Kampala, where we were working at a Bible college teaching and training women and men for ministry across Uganda and East Africa. So now back at Oak Hill um, as director of cross-cultural training. So that is a role um, helping and enabling those who might be considering long-term overseas ministry and mission. Um, but also to help all of our students to consider what it looks like to think um, and minister to those of other cultures. Mm, mm. An increasingly important role in Great Britain. There will be almost no student who leaves Oak Hill um, wherever they might end up within the UK who ends up in a monocultural setting with just people from their own culture. Right. All will be ministering interculturally with those from other cultures. So to think carefully how to do that is key for all of our students. Wonderful. Well, we are so glad you're here at Oak Hill. You're, you've been, already been a blessing to us all. You had a chance to go to a, a really exciting, I mean, a world event of, of a missions conference recently. Can you tell us about that? Uh, genuinely global events, of which there are not many that take place that are truly global. So it is called the Lausanne Congress. Mm. Now, that might sound a bit confusing because Lausanne is a town in Switzerland. I didn't go to Switzerland. I went to Seoul um, in South Korea. The reason it's called Lausanne is because that's where the first of these global gatherings took place 50 years ago in 1974. And there's been three others since then in Manila in the Philippines in 1989, Cape Town in South Africa in 2010, and then of course Seoul in South Korea in 2024. And these congresses are very large global gatherings of evangelicals worldwide. Um, to think about, pray about, talk about, and collaborate in um, the evangelization of the world, so to speak, uh, mission, uh, what the Lord is doing, and how we can participate in what he's doing. And so it is a massive event. There were over 5,000 uh, delegates at this conference from over 200 countries, which, depending on how you define it, is pretty much every country in the world. So it's extraordinarily diverse. You told us beforehand that it was looking like you would get representatives from every country. It might not quite have worked out that way, but it was very close. It was pretty close to that. There's 202 countries, believers from 202 countries there. Pretty much that's every political nation on earth, uh, which is remarkable. Is it fair to say this is the first time in church history where a conference could be held with Christians coming from every nation or almost every nation? I think it is true to say that this was almost certainly the most diverse gathering of Christians in church history. Mm. Um, and what was great, Eric, is that it wasn't just diverse. So you could be diverse. If you had a conference that was 90% American and British and then had one each from the other 198 or whatever countries, that would be, technically speaking, diverse. It was more than that. It was um, representative or at least broadly representative. So... In our world today, many people don't realize that actually about 80% of evangelicals live in what we might call the global south, which yeah. is, broadly speaking, Africa, South America, and Asia. Mm. Um, and so only 20% of evangelicals live in Europe and North America. Mm. Of course, if you look at many of our bookshelves or podcasts or just the resources that are there, you might think it's the other way around. But the vast majority of global evangelicals do live in the global south. And the Lausanne Congress there in South Korea reflected that, maybe mm. not perfectly, but the vast majority of delegates were from the Global South. And mm. that was really um, obvious when you're just sitting down over breakfast, immediately you're meeting people from Egypt and India and um, Peru mm. and uh, Pacific Islands and so on. And you, st you start to get the sense from more than just statistics, but in real life that, yes, um, evangelicalism is strongest in the Global South. Um, so it was incredibly diverse and very representative, beautifully so. I heard a statistics uh, once that if you were to take 100 Anglican Christians at random 
it's most likely the person you would pick would be a sub-Saharan African woman. Yeah, that's that right. Where, yeah. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of median uh, location of Christians today is somewhere around Niger in yeah. um, sort of West Africa. So by median, what we mean is uh, if you were to have the same number of Christians to the north of you and the south of you mm. and the same number of Christians to the east of you and the west of you, that kind of middle spot, so to speak, would be around Niger today. Mm. Uh, or across West Africa, whereas um, even just 200 years ago, mm. that would have been in Southern Europe, and a millennium ago, that would have been in kind of, uh, you know, Central or even Western Europe. Sure. So you're seeing the shift of the church so southwards mm. um, in terms of Africa and Latin America, and also eastwards towards um, Asia and mm. Southeast Asia. And of course, the Congress being held in South Korea mm. is quite reflective of that South Korea country that just um, three or four generations ago at the turn, at the start of the 20th century, the, the church would have been, was very small and sort of insignificant in the kind of numeric sense. And now uh, it is is huge in South Korea. Um, some of the biggest churches and congregations in the world are in yeah. South Korea. Yeah. And um, uh, that kind of reflects the growth of the spread of the gospel and the growth of evangelicalism across the global yeah, yeah. today. And that was really reflected at the meeting, at the Congress, which was very beautiful. So things are shifting radically and across a world, worldwide scale. Give us your sense from the Lausanne Conference. Congress, sorry, my mistake. What are some new things God is doing in the world? What are some challenges that, that different Christians face around the world? Give us a sense of how things are shifting. Broadly speaking... The aim and ambition and kind of purpose of the Lausanne movement, which began in 1974 through originally kind of Billy Graham and his ministries, and then later joins in with John Stott, this side of the Atlantic and others worldwide. The original vision was um, to think about uh, evangelization of the world. One of the taglines of Lausanne has been the whole church bringing the whole gospel to the whole world. Mm and trying to really think in terms of the fullness of what is church, what is the gospel, and and, and where is the world, so to speak. Mm. Um, and, and those kind of emphases remain. Lo Lausanne has a fourfold um, ambition, and that is the gospel for every person mm. in the world, um, disciple-making church for every people and place in the world, um, uh, Christ-like leaders for every church and sector, and then a kingdom impact for every sphere of society. So they're the kind of broad ambitions, and they remain and have remained throughout the five decades long history of the Lausanne movement. But of course, the world changes and the context changes. And so there's lots that has uh, needs to be kind of freshly spoken about, which is why they do one of these congresses every 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the emphases at this most recent congress, they perhaps weren't so obvious previously, were things like uh, ministry and mission in a digital age. So thinking particularly of um, the rise in AI and its impact on evangelism and discipleship. Uh, there was quite a strong emphasis on um, migration and movements. So that was one of the tracks that I joined in the afternoons where we were able to split up into different kind of focus groups. And I and about 300 or so others uh, each afternoon met to think about what God is doing in the world through movements. Um, so one stat that I think is really compelling is that right now there are 280 million people in the world who live outside of the country of their birth. Well, you would be one of those, Eric. Um, yeah. about two of my children would be as well, but 280 million people. That's not even to mention second and third generation, sure. those uh, who are you know, born of Im immigrant parents and so on. But actually that number, 280 million, by 2050, which is not that far off, yeah. Is, is estimated to rise to 1.2 billion. Wow. Which even if, let's say, that estimation fell by half, um, would still be, you know, a, an incredible increase. And that's going to have profound implications, not only for our world as we see it and know it today, but also ministry and mission. So what is the Lord doing through migration, both in terms of Christian migrations, bringing the gospel to new places or revitalizing, reviving churches like we're seeing in, in London, or indeed migration uh, of non-Christians or perhaps mm. Christians, for, uh, sorry, people from places where Christianity is not strong, mm. coming to places where they can then hear about the Lord Jesus and perhaps even take that back to their home countries. 
So all of these opportunities that mm. migration is providing, that was one of the new focus uh, foci of, of the Congress. That's fascinating. I've heard a, a number of Japanese people will leave Japan, encounter the gospel, the Lord will meet them, and then they'll go back to Japan. But that's frequently, in, in that context, exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely right. Um, just seeing that migration is not simply a kind of um, human... Uh, phenomenon in the world today that needs responding to, although it is that, but actually seeing it as something more deeper, more profound, and dare we say it's something more theological in the sense that God is at work through migration, has purposes in migration. Um, if you read the Bible story um, through the lens of migration, you start to realize that actually um, the Lord has always worked through the movement of his people. And that seems to be very much the case today, even accelerating. And so thinking, what does it teach us about God and God's nature? What does it teach us about the world we live in? And trying to, therefore, as Christians, move beyond, at least to a point, the political questions, which are important and significant and need wrestling with mm -hmm. when it comes to issues of culture and multiculturality and migration and so on, but actually trying to see uh, through them or beyond them, or at least have a theological and biblical perspective on them mm. to recognize the challenges that come no doubt but also the missional opportunities that god seems to be providing through this remarkable change and transformation that is happening in the 21st century so lausanne uh, the congress it's a place you know that was one of the the focuses that really came across very strongly mm. Mm. in the midst of this wonderful opportunity that god is giving us what are some new challenges the church around the world is facing? So I think one of the keys that came across, the key challenges that came across, is how there needs to be better collaboration within global evangelism. We live, of course, in an age of remarkable technological progress where communication is global and almost instantaneous, mm -hmm. and yet um, we are still very much, as global evangelicals, siloed into our own little ministries and mm. settings and on one hand that's inevitable and perhaps even right we are where the lord has placed us and that is where our focus primarily must be but actually to recognize that we live in this unparalleled era of um knowing christians from around the world uh, that we can access their thought their experiences their theology their questions their answers their biblical readings um uh, we can access that and learn from that and collaborate with others in our own ministries and missions. We're facing global problems and global challenges, and evangelicals must respond globally if we mm. have any chance of um, thinking rightly about these issues and responding appropriately to them. So I think, I think just the emphasis on collaboration was really important. You mentioned accessing the experiences, the insights that global Christians have. Are there some specific and particular ways that UK Christians could access that? So um, so for me personally, just being at that Congress was an extraordinary thing. In the main hall, 5,200 of us were actually able to sit around tables of six or seven. And so on my table, you know, there was a Christian publisher from East Africa. There was a young, one of the youngest Japanese pastors. Um, there was a, a, a young theological student from Central Europe. There was... Um, an American theologian working with um, disability ministries. So even just around that table, there was an amazing sense of after each session, we would discuss it around our table. And I was hearing and understanding new ideas, new ways of thinking that really made me see that my own corner of evangelicalism is quite small. That doesn't make it uh, wrong or or um, uh, inappropriate at all but it is just quite small even within evangelicalism I'm not even talking world Christianity but evangelicalism however we quite draw those lines my own corner of it is remarkably small and actually seeing that not as a threat um, mm. they are oh, they're, they're not like me but rather an extraordinarily beautiful thing that um, the Lord is at work mm. across the world in ways that um, I just got a little glimpse that I was privileged to get a little taste of there at the Lausanne Congress. Um, and I think that is that was really encouraging for me um, in, in, a, in a setting here in the UK where we can feel very small and perhaps are very small in a sense, numerically speaking, and where our impact can feel quite 
um, low at times, actually to see the Lord powerfully at work across the world reinforces that teaching of Jesus in Matthew 16 that, um, you know, that the, the, the kingdom will grow, the church will grow, even the gates of Hades will not overcome what the Lord is building in his church. And I think we saw that very powerfully. So in terms of your question, Eric, in terms of just accessing the richness and um, diversity of global evangelical thought worldwide, I mean, it goes without saying that the internet just connects us to resources, podcasts, books, in ways that we just weren't able to even just 20 years ago. Mm. And so perhaps if I could just name one example of that, there's a Christian publisher, Langham Publishing, who are doing remarkable work in enabling and empowering and equipping Global South voices from Africa and Asia and Latin America to write and publish what they've been speaking on for you know generations, but that we normally haven't had access to in the Western world. Sometimes it's been said, Eric, that there is a theological famine in the global south. That's not true at all. Um, Christians around the world and across the ages have been theologizing in the sense of um, seeking answers to what it looks like to live Christianly in their own settings and contexts. Um, Theologizing is going on in every church community worldwide. What we now have unparalleled access to is the kind of... um, the, the the written or the spoken um, uh, fruits of that theologizing that we're able to then learn from and enjoy. And so reading some of the books that Langham publishers are, are getting out, hearing from voices from other contexts, I find really enriches my own faith and understanding, not just on a global level, but even in my own context here in the UK. Mm-hmm. I actually loaned you a book from Langham uh, by Jerry Huang fascinating book on contextualizing Christianity in Chinese South Asian context, especially using the Old Testament to do that. Uh, it was just wonderful to read. Um, uh, are there in particular podcasts or things on YouTube or a little bit more accessible media that, that UK Christians could get at to get a sense of the richness of what's going on in the church around the world? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a number one example of what you've just said would be a podcast called um, Meet an African Pastor, which is Literally just that each week the host um, who works in Uganda actually uh, interviews a different pastor who is working sometimes in quite remote or rural areas across the continents and just hears their voice. What are they doing? How are they finding? What are the challenges? What are they learning from the Bible? What are the what are, what is the Lord doing through that church? And I just think a, a podcast like that, we have access to voices of um normal African pastors, so to speak, in ways that just a generation ago we almost never would have. Mm. And I think that is a real gift to the church. And as and as much as modern technological change, the rise of AI and so on, can be a very frightening and threatening thing because things are changing so fast and that's hard. Actually, it, such technologies open up possibilities for us to learn from and engage with and be blessed by global evangelicals in ways that we are the first generation in church history to be able to have access to that and i think that's something to um to really enjoy and um kind of utilize as best we yeah. can i remember in, uh, over a decade ago it was now uh there were some different things happening in iraq and i was able to email a pastor in iraq and say i'm praying for you um we had never met before and that would have been impossible even five years ago what a wonderful opportunity in a very difficult part of the world. Chris, let's say uh, a, a UK pastor is listening or a layperson in a church, and they're noticing a consistent pattern of Ugandan or Iranian or Indian or Chinese families showing up. How would you like the pastor to engage with, think about, uh, and treat that as a wonderful ministry opportunity? Could you speak to that a little bit? Thank you. We we live in an age then where you don't have to turn on the news from long to see that there are huge um, differences in opinion about um, immigration into the UK today, how it's happening, what the results are, um, big debates about who we are as a country, what our identity should be, whether it should be rooted in some sort of British indigenous culture, whatever quite that might be, or whether multiculturality is who we are as Britain or who Mm. we should be or want to be. And I think pastors could easily um, get very wrapped up in such debates. And it wouldn't be necessarily wrong to do so, or at least to be engaged with them, because certainly those in our pews are. 
But I think one thing I'd want to encourage and appeal to is to recognize, as we we're saying earlier, Eric, that to to see what God is doing in this, not to purely um, see it as a, a political issue, mm-hmm. although it is it is it is that, um, or simply a kind of uh, a, a, an issue that is happening a response to things like climate change and war, and to recognize that Christians can and should be hospitable as immigrants move into this country. They are all good things, but rather to ask slightly deeper questions than that and say, is this a great work that God is doing in the world today to achieve his purposes? <laughs> what might he be doing by bringing, for example, um, uh, the recent um, large increases in Hong Kong believers coming mm. to the UK, many of our churches, particularly in our towns and cities, mm. you will enter and now find brothers and sisters who were in Hong Kong five years ago mm. who have now moved to the UK. Um, one friend of mine says that British churches have been praying for revivals for many generations. It's just that they didn't, it's come, but they just haven't recognized it because it's from outside. Wow. And so once that 14% of um, Londoners are black, but some might say that even 60%, some estimate that up to 60% of church goers in London are black. Um, the rise in Chinese Christians in our churches recently. And so the, the Lord seems to be doing something quite powerful and profound, mm. perhaps even in terms of uh, renewal, refreshing, maybe even revival in mm. certainly London Christianity, but other large towns and cities across the UK too. And so I would ask um, the pastors to think it through theologically and missiologically Mm. um look around the communities that you are part of uh, whereas in the past fulfilling the lord's command to make disciples of all nations almost always involved travel intentional movement now it still does there are plenty of peoples around the world who will not hear of the lord jesus if it does not involve christians moving Mm. and crossing geographical territorial boundaries but at the same time more and more the nations are, of course, coming to London and to the UK. Mm. And so what an opportunity that is towards the evangelization of the world, the fulfillment of the Great Commission, if we were to use such language, um, uh, that the Lord is putting on our own doorsteps. Mm. And so as pastors think about mission and missions in the world today, it's not just that going and sending, though that remains absolutely crucial, I'm convinced of it, but also asking what the opportunities are that the Lord is providing in our own settings as well. Hmm. Hmm. That's a fascinating thought, that God has been answering our prayers, but in an unexpected form. So, Chris, tell us about some especially striking experiences you had during the Congress. There are so many, Eric. I think two evenings jump out for me. One was an evening where we had a particular focus on the persecuted church worldwide. Um, That was a remarkable event. One thing that took place was that they invited one believer from each of the 50 most persecuted countries in the world today to take the stage with a sign with their country on it and just to um, say a quick prayer even just Lord have mercy uh, for that country one every 30 seconds which when you have 50 that took quite a while and uh, they just come up one after the other and that came after a session where we've been hearing some of the most remarkable testimonies from Christians who lived and ministered and Uh, evangelized and discipled in the context of persecution, their courage, perseverance, and endurance in that. We heard from Christians who, uh, or a Christian brother who, after the last Lausanne Congress in 2010, uh, came back to his country and had been um, imprisoned for five years following um, and uh, made a a sort of joke about how he hopes that doesn't happen this time, just sort of speaking lightly about something so weighty and crushing and impactful was very... um, very striking on the rest of us who live in contexts of such uh, comfort and ease and and freedom. So I think to see believers from all these countries um, to pray for their countries, I think it's over 300 million brothers and sisters um, live in contexts of persecution. Wow. I think that was really moving and striking. And actually the message that came across there, Eric, from many was not so much pity us, pity us, but rather pray for us and also learn from us Mm. and remarkably we have the privilege of being in a persecuted context with all the joys um, of communion and closeness with the Lord that that persecution brings 
And of course, um, being in the UK where there's so much freedom to practice our faith um, uh, and, and the kind of complacency that that can sometimes breed as a result of that, to hear persecuted believers say, don't pity us, but learn from us and even rejoice with us, felt very Acts 5, where the apostles leave having been, um, you know, whipped for their beliefs, uh, the leave rejoicing that they were considered worthy for suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. So yeah. I saw that there in, in Lausanne. That was extraordinary. And just very briefly, Eric, the, the sec- one of the sec- a second highlight for me was one evening when uh, the Korean church um, in Korean were able to present the history of their of Christianity in their country um, and both the joys of that with regard to remarkable church growth and missionary sending growth. Did you know that Korea is now the second largest missionary sending country in the world mm. after the US, mm. which is remarkable, isn't it? So to, to experience the joys of um, Korean Christianity, but also to um, suffer, to hear about their sufferings uh, through the Korean War in the World War Two, and then the Korean War in the 40s and 50s, and then um, obviously the, the ongoing sufferings of having a people divided in terms of North Korea and South Korea. Um, but also they were very open and honest, remarkably so, in outlining what they perceived to be their own failures in their churches today, denominational competitiveness, corruption, a lack of um, integrity amongst some leaders, um, uh, and, and really asking for prayer from their global brothers and sisters for those issues and to stand up in front of the world, so to speak, and really be open about your own failures and shortcomings in a context of such church growth recently, I thought was a real challenge to be self-aware, humble um, and uh, and prayerful in these matters. So that was really striking. Wow. What an amazing opportunity for representatives from the global church to pray for the global church. That must have been Really uh, unforgettable. Uh, and, you know, you're there in a hall uh, around tables seeing you know, people from every continent on each table pretty much um, just praying for the church in Korea or some of these persecuted countries that we spoke of a moment ago. There's something so beautifully global about that. And, of course, what it reflects is the uh, global, universal create, uh, nature of our creator and redeeming God and that he is not a local God. Christianity is not a faith restricted to one particular culture or language or tribe or people or continent or race, even though some might try and uh, claim that or even, God forbid, behave in that way. Actually, we follow a God of the whole world. Mm. And I think that has always been true, um, of course. But I think to see it embodied so tangibly, visibly, um, at a Congress like Lausanne was mm. profoundly encouraging to me personally. And actually, uh, many of us made the, the, the sort of connection with Revelation 7, where, of course, we see this great heavenly vision of mm. those from every tribe, tongue, nation, people worshipping the Lamb around the throne of God um, in, in the new creation. And just something, there was something, just a little glimpse, a little taste of that at this Lausanne Congress in a way that I don't think uh, I've experienced quite so powerfully before. Uh, and in that sense, for all the mass work and cost and effort that goes into um, a Congress like this that is just unimaginably massive in terms of logistics and administration, actually to uh, encourage those of us who were there and hopefully through podcasts like this or you know, many of us to encourage us to see how God is at work um, across the whole world I think is really valuable. Mm. I was going to ask you what encouragements you see for people who are listening to this podcast, but I think you just answered that. That would certainly be the main encouragement I would take away. I think as well, Lausanne works really hard to make sure that there are younger leaders there mm. participating in these congresses. And so there was a lot of what we might call Gen Z, those mm. who are uh, sort of digital natives, those who were born and grew up in this digital age in the 21st century, younger people um, many spoke from the front. Uh, they were uh, throughout the hall as well. And I think uh, to recognize that as much as some countries, including the UK at times, have an, quite an aging church, mm. and that can be quite visible at times. And certainly when it comes to some of our mission agencies and the prayer meetings that we have, they can sometimes look quite aged, actually, to see so many young people gathering together with all the 
decades ahead, God willing, that they have of ministry and mission to see their love for the Lord, their energy, the way they're thinking digitally and employing those resources in their outreach uh, and to see their excitement for what the Lord is doing, I think was thrilling as well. Mm, wonderful. So Chris, tell us how this particular Lausanne Congress has made you excited for the future. There was a real focus on the year 2050. There was a real sense of looking for the next quarter century. What are the gaps that are still present in our world evangelization and how can we collaborate to try and narrow those gaps? So we had already talked about uh, migration and so how that is a uh, a gap in our kind of thinking about world mission that we were working to fill. But there were other working groups that were looking at things like um, evangelism and uh, digital tools, looking at uh, youth ministries, looking at Islam, looking at um, urbanization, uh, looking at unreached people groups and so on. So I think the developing really good collaborative networks of Christians from different continents to work together to fill these global gaps in mission mm. uh, as we work towards 2050, recognizing that the Lord has done extraordinary work yeah, and continues to do so um, through his church in recent decades, but recognizing that this is no time for complacency, mm. that there are huge challenges still to come. I think one encouragement that I will really take away is, I'm going to use a theological word here, but I'll explain it, the a sort of polycentric nature of Christianity today. So what what I mean by that is polycentric, meaning it, there is a multiple centers of Christianity. Mm. It is not Christianity is not founded and located uh, in in sort of one place that that it must spread from, but actually that it it is polycentric. It is from everywhere to everywhere. And I think seeing and hearing about African churches sending missionaries, um, uh, you know, the Korean church, countries from all around the world, not just receiving missionaries but actually sending in mission and recognizing that that kind of multi-directional as i say polycentric nature of mission today i think that is the future of mission mm. um, and i think that is where we are going to see the acceleration of uh of the of gospel growth of kingdom growth around the world as um as mission doesn't just become a kind of west to the west yeah. so to speak but actually become something from everywhere to everywhere and all the inherent immense almost infinite possibility and potential that comes with that so as we look towards 2050 i think let's all be looking out for that let's be praying for that mm. let's be um uh recognizing that where we see it including in our own countries where we have missionaries from other countries arriving to help us in this context Let's be ready to receive that as well. And um, I think that is an exciting work that the Lord is doing. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for sharing with us. And thank you to everyone who watched and listened. God bless.